Yo, what is gaming, gamers? How about that wild trailer, eh? Pretty cool. Lots to theorize over, and theorize we shall. As we now must sit tight and wait out the gap in Wild's info until Capcom deems us worthy of a morsel, a crumb of that sweet, sweet nectar in summer, what better place to start than with some monster predictions? Uh, well, perhaps predictions isn't the best word because these are largely baseless and much more of a wish list, I suppose. The devs over at Capcom have a tendency to bring back some old faces when embarking on a new game development cycle, and there's no reason to believe that Wilds will be any different. This allows them to provide us designs that bring back returning players, bolster the amount of content in a single game with less development time spent, and all in all maintain the identity of Monster Hunter. I mean, even though it was a given that he'd show up, Seeing Rathalos at the end of the Wilds trailer was a little hit of dopamine in its own right, and whilst I think there are some monsters that could move over and let someone else take a turn for once, there's no denying that Capcom are the kings of recycling content in the right way. The question then arises, well, which monsters will return? Honestly, we have no idea outside of Rathalos, but there's some that are probably a pretty solid bet. Rathian is basically guaranteed, Diablos is also like a... 99% chance of showing up at this point. Zenoga, Nagakuga, and Gormagala are some fan favorites that I imagine will top out Capcom's upcoming favorite monster survey, so these are the guys we can expect to show up. But let's get a little bit more interesting with it. I've wrangled together 10 ish monsters that I want to see in wilds who either deserve some more screen time or should get a second shot at greatness. And before we get into it, Bracadios will not be on this list because it got so much love in Iceborne, but know that I will always wish for Bracadios to return because I love him. All right, enough of that. Let's get into it. Kicking off our list in the number one slot has to be the monster that put my channel on the map. One that will always be on my wish list to return and one that I have always loved. The Monoboss. Despite a strong start in the first entry of the series as the final boss monster before the credits rolled, Monoboss has sunken so far into Diabloss' shadow that it's almost non-existent anymore. I was frankly shocked it even showed up in Stories 2, to be honest. With Diabloss being all but guaranteed to be included in Monster Hunter Wilds, Monoboss will need to stand out as its own monster this time around. An equal to Diabloss in power, but not in its approach to fighting. I mean, if we can get both Rathian and Rathalos in, like, every single game ever, we can easily have these two side by side. The most obvious way to make Monoboss stand out is to better use its single horn and thinner build. Whilst Diabloss is all about brute strength and absolute power, I think the Monoboss could stand to use a lot more thrusting, sweeping, and stabbing style attacks in its repertoire, being more... Uh, graceful than Diabloss. Almost like the Lance or Longsword to Diabloss's greatsword, so to speak. Give it some fake outs, some more interesting digging attacks, but also give it that Diabloss drill dig thing that it has because that shit is awesome. Just, just bring it back, Capcom, please. The next monster is one that is long overdue for a bit of love, I think, and another that has been around since the beginning of the series. I'm of course talking about Gravios. For the new heads in the fandom, uh, you remember Basarios from Rise? And do you also remember Shogun Senator from Sunbreak? Yeah, so Basarios is actually the juvenile form of a monster called Gravius, and you may have thought, what monster skull is the Senator's shell supposed to be? Yep, uh, that is also Gravios, and yet, Gravios is nowhere to be seen in Rise or Sunbreak. It's, it's just rude. Same can be said for Monoboss, the Daimyo Hermitor's shell is also a Monoboss skull. If Gravius was to return, I think it may need some tweaks to bring it up to date just a little bit. You could really bolster the fight just by incorporating Basarios' heat up mechanic that it had in Rise, maybe make it only last for a few seconds or be across different parts of the body. And I think a little bit of a redesign is in order too. The spikes that you see across Gravius read visually as vents for excess heat, they do to me anyway, so use that more. Maybe make smoke or gas billow out of them. Maybe even make it superheat the air around it when enraged, like a flame aura like Teostra. Just give it something a bit more, I think. They also should do something about the wings. All of the first gen wyverns suffer from a very similar body plan, and as such, they all have these big wings, despite some of them not really being able to fly a whole lot. Gravios is so damn bulky and heavy that I think it makes sense to tone down the wings a little bit. Maybe give them larger, rockier surfaces used to smash hunters and support its massive size, almost like a pseudo wyvern. I'm not saying they need to go away completely, not at all, just change them just a little bit, like they're a vestigial holdover from their ancestors. Something like that. Alright, moving away from the old heads. 
well, d away from the really old heads. I love me a bird wyvern. There's something about the class that is just really appealing and endearing, I think, and they are quite frankly at their best when they don't take themselves too seriously. Leave that shit to the flying and brute wyverns. Of these bird wyverns, there are two standouts that we have not seen in a good long while. The first is the Hypnocatrice, and the second is of course the Kurapeko. Both of these monsters are currently stuck in their debut generations, at least in the mainline series. Hypnocatrice has only ever appeared in Freedom Unite and the two MMOs where it got a few variations, and Kurapeko is locked entirely within the Gen 3 games, only having shown up in spin-offs like Stories since then. So why not give them an Another shot. These two are excellent examples of the Bird Wyvern class and offer very interesting early to mid game fights. Kurapeko is just a top to bottom delight of a monster to go up against, having so much personality and embracing goofy little gimmicks along with an entirely unique series of animations. It has a unique take on a breath attack, using flints on its wings to ignite its saliva, it inflates its neck sack to mimic and summon other monsters to help it out, and it's one of the few monsters to use the defense down effect. Hypnocatrice is then just a great example of a very bird like bird wyvern. It has its very iconic kicking attacks that set it apart from most other monsters, and sure, sleep can be annoying, but I think it fits the vibe really well. If I had to pick one over the other, I'd have to go with Kurapeko, but I would just love to see either of them again. So let's bring back at least one, if not both. I think that they can each shine in their own right with a fresh coat of paint, and they don't really need much in the way of a redesign, just bring them into line with the rest of the modern roster. Alright, it wouldn't be a returning monster wishlist without a colossal monster now, would it? We got plenty of of options to choose from, so why not bring back one of the best ones? Gen Miranda was a truly impressive experience back when it showed up in Gen 3, and remains one of the most memorable colossal fights we've ever gotten. For those unfamiliar, Gen Moran is a gigantic whale-like elder dragon with huge tusks and oars growing from its back. It spends its time swimming through the sand of the Great Desert and is fought by setting sail on a dragon ship that will keep pace with the dragon as it swims. This would be a tricky one to bring back, admittedly, because assuming that Wilds is open world, or at least partially open world, means that you'd have a hard time recreating the feeling of the fight without a truly gigantic in-game desert area. The original fight was essentially just your ship and Gen Moran remaining stationary side by side with a few visual effects that makes it feel like you are speeding through a desert. Maybe you can put it in its own instance as a special event or something, I don't know. I reckon they could come up with something though. It would be an insane spectacle of a fight in glorious high definition and who knows, maybe it's even the cause of the sandstorm we see in the Wilds trailer. Probably not, but a man can dream. Alright, this next one is a bit of a stretch for a few reasons, but hey, it's my list, I'm keeping it here. And we're moving towards the topic of subspecies. My absolute favourite subspecies are the ones that take the base concept and ideas of a monster and recontextualize them into a new setting. This can be done with a new element or ecology, but they have to keep the essence of the original one. Very few subspecies do this the same way that the Jade Barrel does. This guy was an ice element barrel subspecies added in Monster Hunter Portal third, and it hit the mark so well because it subbed in snow instead of mud, and Barrel's head design lends itself so well to a sort of snowplow kind of motif. It was great, and it's a bit bizarre that it's been so long since we've seen it in a mainline game. I mean, it would have fit really well into the Hawfrost Reach when they were showing off their lovely new snow physics. This is of course assuming that Baroth itself shows up in the game, which, I mean, it's got a pretty good track record at this point, and has become a bit of a staple since it debuted in Try, so I don't think that's such a long shot. The long shot is whether or not subspecies are in it at all. Base World only had three, and by the end of Sunbreak, we only had four in rise, none of which were returning ones, so maybe they're a dying breed. I don't know. Gen 5 was the generation of the Fanged Wyverns. We've got a huge amount of diversity for them in World and Rise, including our second flagship one. And now it's the Snake Wyverns turn. Previously they were held back by hardware limitations much like the Leviathans, but we've come a long way and now it's time. The Najarala is the next monster on my list and it will remain on all future lists until it gets some justice because it's just such a unique and cool monster. Najarala was added to the series in Monster Hunter 4 and remains the only large snake wyvern ever created. A gripe that I have that may warrant its own entire video. It's effectively a huge snake with a massive beak tiny legs and a huge fan-shaped tail. It can attack by either coiling around you and paralyzing you, burrowing underground and bursting out from beneath, or most notably by throwing its tail scales around and vibrating them to emit ear-splitting sounds and explosions. Depending on how hard they go with wilds, there's some potential for some 
absolutely insane terrain interaction with this guy, and he could pave the way for Snake Wyverns to make a comeback in a big way. All right, okay. Now, not everything on this list has to be a large monster. In fact, I encourage everyone to have a think about the small monsters we might see as well. Small monsters are an important part of the Monster Hunter world, so I had to think about what my favorite ones are, and aside from the obvious return of Abdenoth, fingers crossed he was left out of Rise after being in like every single Monster Hunter game ever. Uh, that was illegal and a criminal offense. Um, yeah. I'd like to see the return of the Laranoth. These guys are a weird pick because they have so little impact on gameplay and are straight up here for the vibes. Laranoth were the default herbivore for the Jurassic Frontier map and just felt so well suited and thematic for that kind of environment. They are essentially sauropods with vents running up their neck, which allows them to make some pretty loud trumpet sounds and are just way bigger than any other herbivore that we have seen. If they did come back, it would be more for the aesthetic and the vibe than anything else, really. Assuming we're going Going for a more tribal and prehistoric feel for wilds and well i just love dino monsters man what can i say i'm a simple guy it has been too long capcom just do it the time is now no more messing around bring her back hashtag justice for gameth Gameth was the only Gen 4 flagship monster, it was the only mainline flagship monster aside from Lagicris that got absolutely zero representation in Generation 5. Seriously, every single other mainline flagship was present in either or both of the Gen 5 games in some shape or form. Bloodbath Diablos even got some love in the form of the Apex Diablos, and Espinas even made the jump from Frontier to mainline. This is getting ridiculous. Gameth is a monster I just absolutely adore, and I think it will just fit the increased scale of wilds so damn well. For those unfamiliar, Gameth is a gigantic mammoth-like monster with red, white, and blue fur that lives in the tundra, stomping its way around and throwing ice at whatever looks at it the wrong way. It also has the best battle theme ever. I think it could use a bit of tweaking of its moveset, but otherwise keep it big, slow, and powerful. And if they dare change the battle theme too much, there will be hell to pay. Capcom, you have been warned, my expectations are high. Now on to a couple of monsters I think they did a great job with in Generation 5 to round out our list. The first is the best monster introduced in Base Rise, which has got to be the Ghost Harag. This guy was such a great little extra branch out for the Fanged Beast class, and gave them a monster that was truly frightening without being a big angry monkey. Despite absolutely loving its design, I did feel like Ghost Harag was not as difficult as it should have been, because the wire bugs just gave the hunters too much speed and agility for him to keep up. Assuming that the combat is more grounded in wilds, this should mean that Ghost Harag would naturally be more difficult and scarier, dealing out massive damage if its attacks connect. I think it would fit really well as a sort of reclusive, wandering, abominable snowman kind of monster in an icy corner of the map in wilds. I mean, it's not completely outside the realm of possibility. Those lion ogre looking things in the trailer didn't look too far apart from Ghost Harag, so who knows? Also, Capcom, just give us Ghost Harag's Ice Sword Arm as the Great Sword this time. Don't be cowards, quit messing around, just do it, please. And for our final returning monster, I can't help but pick one that was absolutely revolutionary for the series, and I hope is the beginning of a new trend. Espinas is the poster child for the now-closed MMO, Monster Hunter Frontier, and though the game has had a resurgence recently, there is a huge cast of monsters stuck within that game that have never been seen elsewhere. But Espinas may be the beginning of something great, and hopefully is the floodgates just opening for all the frontier monsters. More frontier representation is a great thing, and originally seeing Espanas in that Sunbreak trailer was an absolutely bonkers revelation for most old school hunters. I personally love the fight and the new interpretation of Espanas's frontier mechanics and found it to be super engaging and intense in Sunbreak, though I do understand that for those who had the pleasure of experiencing Espanas years ago, it did take away from it a little bit. Espanas has a few particular gimmicks that make it unique. It begins the hunter sleep, has absolutely shocking hits zones when it isn't enraged, and it boasts fireballs that both paralyze and poison you. Honestly, it was a ballsy monster to bring to the mainline series at all, because all of those things are so separate from the norm, but they did it, and I'm glad for it. I also just really like getting some classic wyverns every now and then. Monster Hunter rarely misses with monster design, but there is so much work done to innovate and deviate from pre-existing tropes and expectations, when sometimes all I want personally is a good classic flying wyvern. And Espinas certainly ticks that box. There you have it, my wish list of returning monsters that we may or may not see 
in Monster Hunter Wilds next year. With a brand new generation of Monster Hunter looming on the distant horizon, who's to say what we might see next? It could be like Try, where everything is brand new apart from Rathalos, Rathian, and Diablos. It could be like World, where half the roster was returning monsters. Who knows? All we know is that it's sure to be a good time. I do hope we get some truly amazing new faces in the roster, and I'm sure we will, but the monsters in this video are the ones I would like to see return after my experience with them over the last 20 years. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and keep your eyes glued to this channel as we get more Monster Hunter Wilds news in the future. It's going to be a hell of a year waiting for it, but we all got to stick together through these hard times. Thanks for watching the video, guys. I'll see you on the next one. Catch you later.